what is really real? Is the ground really here? We say that objects like the ground are composed of molecules, and those molecules are composed of atoms. Here's a simple illustration of the atom. You can see that in the center is the nucleus, and that has protons and neutrons. And around the nucleus are electrons. But you might also notice there's some void space or empty space in this atom. Can you estimate the percentage of void space in an atom? It's 99.9% .9 void space. And actually, there's 13 nines after that decimal point. <laughs> so the ground seems solid, seems like it's here, but it's nearly 100% nothing. <laughs> Same goes for the stage, the seats, this whole auditorium. You know, and I know that in pop culture, they like to tell you that you're significant and you're a somebody, but <laughs> in modern science, you're pretty much nothing. <laughs> tell that to your psychiatrist. <laughs> Everybody has their own view of reality, whether a scientist, a philosopher, or a theologian. You see, philosophers and theologians they debate abstract ideas, kind of like myself, and we wonder, what practical impact are they having on our day-to-day -day lives? And then we see scientists, like myself, and we're seemingly dispassionate people, and we sit in our labs and we do experiments. And we wonder, what contribution are we having to the deeper meaning of life? You see, I'm someone who holds graduate degrees in both science and theology. And I seek the nexus of both science and God, so that I'm neither dispassionate nor impractical. <laughs> Famous scientist Sir Isaac Newton seemed to be able to put together these ideas. And he said the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. But sadly, we have drifted from this point of view. You see, simply what I believe is that science and God, as I have understood them, go together. They're integrated. And even more so, with the advent of modern science in the last hundred years or so, it's actually helped us make some connections of those seemingly mystical qualities about God. I'd like to give you three examples to illustrate this. First one is probability. Probability in modern science is this interesting thing. You see, pretty much everything has a probability, whether it's the normal or the really unusual. Let me give you an example of one of those unusual things. You see, uh, if we take the atom again, the atom, there's actually a probability that a particle in the atom can leave the atom and at the same time violate the law of conservation of energy. Now, the law of conservation of energy says that energy is neither created nor destroyed, yet a particle in the atom, without having the energy to do so, and no available energy, can overcome an energy bar barrier and just leave. That's the weirdness of probability. Now, why is this interesting theologically? Well, theologically, we wondered, well, how can God act in these seemingly miraculous ways? I mean, isn't it just magic and myth? For example, and there's plenty of them, God is described as omniscient, all-knowing outside of time, described as omnipresent, that is, everywhere present. And we wonder, how is this possible? But yet, what if there was a finite probability that God could act miraculously? And that's not impossible. And what if there's a possibility that God doesn't overstep the bounds of science, but actually works within the bounds of nature and science. You see, what I'm saying is this. If modern science tells us there's a probability for unusual activity happening, and we're okay with that, then we should not be as surprised that God could act and do miraculous things, and there's still a probability for that. Now, I'd like to hone in on two of these things that I just mentioned, that of omniscience and omnipresence, and use this in our second two examples. So, next, 
the theory of relativity in our thought discussion of how that connects to omniscience. That is, God is outside of time and knowing all. Well, uh, the theory of relativity came about in the 1900s by Einstein. And it's this theory that has been proven and described over and over throughout the decades. It has many facets. And the one we'll focus on is that between velocity and time. Simply said, the faster an object goes, the more lag in time you'll have. There's an interesting set of experiments that were done to illustrate this in 1971. They're the Hoppel-Keating experiments. They took a couple cesium beam atomic clocks. These are really accurate clocks. And they synchronized them. And they placed one on the ground and one in a commercial airliner that flew around and then later landed on the ground. Well, what did they find? The clocks were no longer synchronized. They were actually off by an order of nanoseconds, and that could be calculated from the theory of relativity. Which one was behind in time? The one that traveled faster in the, on the airliner and later returned to Earth. Well, this idea can be expanded such that the faster you go, the slower time goes until you reach your apex at the universal speed limit. That's the speed of light. And you know, at the speed of light, light travels so fast that time actually no longer progresses. You see, there, time is not a factor for light. Or we might say light is outside of time. Well, that's weird, I know, but that's the theory of relativity. <laughs> Why is this interesting theologically? Well, theologically, we know that God describes himself and is described as light. And yet we wonder, how could God be omniscient? That is, outside of time and knowing all. You see, if consider God, we know he sees past, present, and future all at the same time and knows all. And that seems eerily similar and parallel to the idea that a photon can be outside of time. Now get me straight, I'm not saying that God is a photon. <laughs> what I am saying is that in modern science, if it tells us that light can be outside of time, we should not be as surprised that God could be outside of time. Weird, I know, but let's keep going. Let's evaluate the third topic in modern science that I want to look at, and that's entanglement, and how that relates to the idea of omnipresence. Well, entanglement is this really interesting, strange idea that came about in 1935 by Einstein, Schrodinger, Rosen, and others. And say you, had, say you have two particles, and they could really be photons, electrons, some molecules, various things. And if they're entangled or connected, a change in one will affect a change in another. Well, you think no big deal, but the interesting thing is you can separate them more and more and more, and they can still be entangled. You see, distance doesn't seem to be a relevant factor. This uh, reached the lim furthest limit I've seen in 2012, published in a journal of Nature, where these two entities were separated by 143 kilometers. That's 88 miles, and they were still connected and interacting with each other. That was in the case of photon teleportation from one place to another, and that happened instantaneously. This was fictionalized in the TV and film series Star Trek, if you've heard of it. In Star Trek, they beam people up, and they're moving somebody from one place to another pretty much instantaneously, and the distance doesn't really matter. That's the idea of entanglement. Well, why is this interesting theologically? Theologically, we wondered, how could God be omnipresent? I mean, isn't that kind of weird? Well, if God is here, and he's interacting with people, and those people could be separated a distance from him all around the world, somehow he's doing that instantaneously all the time. This also seems weirdly similar to the idea of entanglement. Get me right, again, I'm not saying that God's an entangled particle. <laughs> what I'm saying is that if in modern science, particles can interact with each other even while separated at a distance, 
we shouldn't be a surprise that God can interact with humans. Again, separated with a distance and doing that instantaneously. Well, you might ask, so what? So what? Well, again, I believe that science and God, as I've understood them, are totally interconnected and integrated. And I know you're going to say, wait a minute. Proofs by analogy are not proofs. And I know that. What I'm saying is, these seemingly mystical qualities about God that we thought were magic actually have an interesting precedent in modern science. You've seen this Erlenmeyer flask of boiling water on stage here for the last 10 minutes or so. And so I ask you, why is the water boiling? Okay, no doubt, you're going to say that the heat from the hot plate is being transferred into the liquid water as the temperature increases, the kinetic energy increases, exciting the liquids in the liquid molecules in that liquid state to go out to the vapor state. The vapor pressure increases increases until it reaches atmospheric pressure, at which point nucleation points within the glass allow bubbles to form, overcoming the enthalpy of vaporization, and thus it boils. <laughs> Duh. But actually, what I tell you is, no, that's not really why the water's boiling. The water's boiling because I want some tea. Mmm, <laughs> love tea. Tea's really good. Which answer is the correct one? You see, we actually need both the science explanation and the deeper meaning explanation to get the fuller picture of reality. Each answer is incomplete without the other and really insufficient without the other. And it causes us to have a smaller understanding of what the reality is. Einstein put it this way, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Now I understand that Einstein didn't have, uh, accept any conventional religion, for sure, but he was moved by some, quote, cosmic religious feeling. Many of you probably here today are academians or students, and you probably are focused on your academics, fields of study, and things like that, possibly without much regard to the deeper meanings of life. And what I'm saying is maybe we're missing out on something. Maybe we need to work towards a reality that's a little bit bigger than that. So I ask you, what is really real? <laughs>